Our next speaker is probably tired because there's a lot of presentations at this meeting. Dr. Todd Shire graduated from Texas San Antonio. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology. He currently serves on the Board of Trustees of the AAP. He practi is, practices based uh, clinical research center in Houston, Texas with Dr. McGuire. And he's published numer numerous articles and has contributed to three textbooks. I'd like you to help me welcome Dr. Todd Shire. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I first want to pre uh, thank the Academy for giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, the way this was brought to us to uh, present on the topic of soft tissue augmentation to optimize the prosthetic outcome was for me to defend or uh, not really debate, but give the option of saving teeth and treating the defect with soft tissue. Uh, I think you'll see from my presentation, certainly in the beginning, that um, us as periodontists want to be equipped to deal with all situations. And oftentimes the situation to save teeth and augment the defect with soft tissue uh, is, is driven by a patient or a restorative doctor. Uh, so by no means do I want to discount the beautiful work of our previous presenter. Uh, I will just obviously be working more towards saving teeth, um, which is something that periodontists can do very, very well with an incredible amount of evidence in our literature. And it's about the smile. It's about our ability to provide the patient uh, an aesthetic result, whether a tooth or an implant. Uh, there are a lot of issues that come into designing the smile. Uh, from the micro-aesthetic elements to the macro-aesthetic elements beyond the lips. And I think we need to take all these things into consideration as we're deciding whether to place an implant or a fixed partial denture. This is a case my partner shows frequently in regards to the power we have in our hands to augment a case with traditional periodontal mucogingival surgery uh, and, and save teeth and, and provide a patient a long-lasting, uh, in this case, a 10-year follow-up of fixed partial denture with augmented soft tissues. In my hands, whether it be uh, a fixed partial denture or an implant-supported restoration, the provisional restoration is the key to our success. Uh, the idea of guided soft tissue regeneration uh, to provide the optimal mature soft tissues before a final restoration is developed is something that I hold very dear to my practice in regards to implant dentistry and traditional periodontal therapy. That this provisional restoration must support the developed tissue through augmentation procedures or tissues that we're trying to maintain in a, in a preservation approach uh, with a provisional restoration. So part of this synopsis for this program was how do we deal with post-extraction buccal plate resorption? And it all comes down to, you know, understanding this defect and how it got there, the reason for the tooth failure, what are the volumetric needs of reconstructing the defect, be it hard, soft tissue, or both, what are our treatment options, what are the patient factors and expectations that come to the table, and how will we provisionalize and finalize this case? We must avoid ridge defects when we can. So thinking ahead of tooth extraction by preserving alveolar ridge defects is critical. We need to look towards the evidence, although it can be debated all day long, uh, we need to look to the evidence that we do have about treating defects and saving teeth. Risk assessment is key, and we'll go into that in just a moment. And avoiding complications, obviously from the standpoint of our own complications, and then how do we deal with complications that present to our office that we're asked to repair, all in order to optimize the outcome. You know, these are things that uh, many of uh, my mentors uh, incorporated into their practice every day. We, we still use techniques such as these um, in regards to root resection. Today, with the success of implants, they're used less and less. But I don't think we want to completely abort these options in treatment uh, because there is some very nice literature out there that shows of long-term success with these treatment modalities. But we must consider uh, 
both options thoroughly, taking into consideration what's the best long-term prognosis, the cost effectiveness, and of course, is it in or out of the aesthetic zone? Most of the studies that we'll talk about in a moment are, are dealing with implant functional success rates, not aesthetic rates. And in how this success leads toward the best aesthetic outcome. What's going to provide the patient, the restorative doctor, and us the optimal aesthetic outcome in the, in the premaxilla area. So implants are teeth in the aesthetic zone. Which one do we select and why? And if we select a certain modality, how are we going to get through the process? Let's touch a bit on the evidence now. Uh, for clinical complication rights, a nice uh, assessment by Dr. Goodacre is looking at a potential complication rate of fixed partial dentures of up to 27%. 18% for caries, 11% for needing root canal therapy, and a 7% loss of retention. For implants, some of the research shows success rates up to 97%, depending on the location of the arch and the bone density. Unfortunately, though, much of the available evidence for single tooth implants is, is not in the aesthetic zone, or if it is, it, 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 it doesn't have long enough follow-up to really give us good guidelines for success rates or aesthetic success rates. So these uh, optimal conditions may not be applicable to most of our practices, uh, given that this type of data or this type of research is conducted in a, in a very um, a perfect situation, so to say, not the everyday grind of, of our private practice. The European workshop on periodontology found that, most importantly, that there was a lack of standardized outcome, uh, making it very difficult to compare papers that exist on aesthetic outcomes in implant dentistry. In two recent reviews, uh, the same thing was found. The comparative studies just don't exist, allowing us to really make uh, strong answers or create strong answers on comparing impl single tooth implant restorations to the fixed partial denture. We do know from classic literature that teeth with a poor or questionable prognosis can be treated and maintained for many, many years. And, and this is what I'll be using to help me uh, convince you that we don't want to dismiss our classic periodontal therapy in rebuilding the edential site with soft tissues to optimize our aesthetic outcome. With uh, success, we understand the de definition of a, of a favorable or desired outcome. This is, could be considered in implant dentistry a functional success, but certainly not an aesthetic success. And if we're le left to repair, potentially replace a defect like this, we are, have a very difficult session, situation to encounter. Not only uh, do we have the, the loss of hard and soft tissues, but relatively no running room to build an emergence profile. That's probing 1.5 millimeters from the gingival margin to the platform. In cases such as these, where the implant is certainly integrated, but how will we correct this when the implant is placed outside the alveolar housing and has left us with a defect that is very hard to recover from? A case like this where porcelain work has been done very well, it would be hard for most of us to argue which is the implant on eight and nine. But when we reflect soft tissues, we are left with a different situation. Again, very hard to recover from a defect such as this. Success with periodontal regeneration is very cut and dry. You either have it or you don't, based on the definition. The same with osseointegration. We either have it or we don't. But with aesthetics, this is more a perception of beauty, and it takes the patient's account into consideration on what they believe is aesthetic. We all have failures and complications, and this is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, it's a difficult factor or issue appearing unexpectedly and changing the existing plans, methods, and attitudes. So how do we avoid these in our practice via implant dentistry or traditional fixed partial dentures? This is a schematic that my partner has uh, taught me over the years, and, and it's critical. It's become a critical part of me communicating with restorative doctors, um, our patients, uh, and I think that, that 
it's really key to understanding all the issues, regardless of the treatment modality we're talking about. The communication, we need to be able to do this effectively with our patients and our referring offices. We need to use things such as this that we've developed many years ago and have shared with the academy in regards to making sure that the restorative dentist has really sat down and thought about the elements that go into smile design by looking at cases together with them and making sure that the patient's perception of aesthetics is taken into consideration. Utilizing provisional restorations to transfer the expected outcome is also a key to success, whether it's for crown lengthening, ridge preservation, augmentation, or dental implants, provisional restorations are key to communicating properly and understanding expected outcomes. So if we have good communication, it should help us with the patient understanding realistic expectations, not just expectations for the patient, but for the periodontist as well. This is a great study by Vince Kokix Jr. that talks about the threshold of noticeability. And what I want to point out on here is that the lay person, the general dentist, and even the orthodontist, it took up to three millimeters of open gingival embrasures to have a, a threshold of noticeability. With the gingival lip distance or a gummy smile, up to four millimeters. All of us in this audience, I'm sure, would be much more critical of that. But we need to take these things into consideration when we're speaking to our patients. When we're talking about referral dentists, as I showed before, these referral slips uh, to help the dentist talk to us, we really need to have an honest and open discussion with that referral uh, if, root if root coverage is desired, to what point? What is their expectation in root coverage? We should all know our Miller's classifications and what we can expect from mucogingival procedures, but does the restorative dentist and the patient understand? And furthermore here, is there hard or soft tissue loss on the adjacent teeth? If so, this may limit the amount of root coverage that is possible. So we're providing them some understanding of our limitations from a surgical perspective. Periodontists kind of want to always shoot for the bullseye. We want 100% root coverage every time. But I think we also need to be realistic on this account that we, we have the ability to achieve that. We have evidence to tell us that we have the ability to achieve 100%. But can we predict this all the time? Not necessarily. Uh, and we certainly don't want to transition that to our patient, that we're going to hit the bullseye every time. Procedural issues hopefully are a given, that we all uh, are equipped with the uh, gift of good mucogingival procedures or dental implant procedures. But it's a lot more than just our surgical skills. It's the patient factors that are brought to the table, whether they're a smoker or have systemic, systemic issues. The defect classification, which we'll go into more detail in a moment. The surgical technique we use, of course, it needs to be good. The post-operative care, which really plays into the idea of restorative and lab support. Restorative and lab support comes in with the provisional restoration. Is the provisional restoration contoured properly? Is it polished properly? Is it modified at the appropriate time? Is it at perhaps delivered at the appropriate time? These are all the procedural issues that become key to ridge reconstruction. And hopefully all things will meet in the middle and provide us the best outcome. Sometimes they'll be separated. And that is what I will show with most of the case presentations today, is that we are confronted with complications where things did not work so well for another practitioner or perhaps us, and how will we bring these things back together and provide the patient the optimal aesthetic outcome. And this is what we're shooting for. Everything meeting in the middle, where we've done the proper diagnostics, we've done the proper procedures, we've communicated properly with the patient in the referral, we've done our uh, wax up to transition or transfer the expected outcome to the patient so they can see what we're doing ahead of time to deliver the final aesthetic outcome. Risk assessment is something that, that is, is key to our communicating properly, developing the appropriate expectations, and delivering the procedures that are going to work for us. And as I already mentioned, patient variables must be considered. All of this list here, their compliance and motivation, their financial status. That's sometimes going to lead us towards uh, saving teeth versus replacing them with dental implants. 
occlusion must be, be considered in this, in the dental disease activity. If they're going to have to transition through a significant hard tissue uh, series of augmentation procedures, perhaps they're not the best candidate for that if they have other diseases that are uncontrolled. Tooth variables, the periodontal status, the endodontic, endodontic status, restorative status, mobility, crown to root ratio, perio defect anatomy, the bone quality and the tissue quality must all be considered. The third dimension, today as very nicely shown in our previous lecture, uh, the power of cone beam technology and understanding defects before we ever touch a patient is uh, extremely valuable. Avoiding intraoperative surprises through cone beam diagnostics is key. To take a defect like this that on a periapical x-ray looks like internal root resorption and seeing it three-dimensionally and seeing the extent of bone and hard and soft tissue loss will encounter this lightly. The surgical variable be considered the surgical skill and training and instrumentation we're using in the access to materials that are available to us today. And perhaps the thing that I've been most influenced upon in my short career is the macroesthetic elements that my partner has taught me and taught so many um, that we, we must consider the things beyond the lips, that we don't have an aesthetic outcome if we consider lip line. Uh, gingival aesthetics and full smile, how this blends with the rest of their face. These are things that must be considered. How the teeth are arranged, how they're shaped, how the tissue is positioned around the teeth. As mentioned already, the biotype and papillary morphology becomes key to aesthetic success. In a case like this where we have originally presented with two failing teeth, I'm not saying that we'd make this decision every time, but the decision in a case like this was done to save one tooth, although it has a guarded comprom uh, or a compromised prognosis, in order to obtain a favorable aesthetic outcome on the single tooth implant. And we'll look at this case in detail in just a while. But there are sometimes sacrifices that must be uh, considered to optimize the aesthetic outcome. And, and that's okay, as long as the patient and the referring doctor understand that there is a compromise here and we may have to confront this later down the road. As I mentioned already, the elements to achieve optimal aesthetic outcomes is something we need to talk long and hard through diagnostic wax up and proper laboratory support. There are other issues that have been uh, shown us in the literature that we need to consider as well, and that is that with multiple or single teeth, that papillary form can oftentimes be better maintained with ponics uh, versus dental implants. We know from the literature that approximately we can expect about 4.5 millimeters of soft tissue above the bone between a tooth and implant or between a ponic and an implant. It's been set, found uh, via Salama that in a pontic site, we're able to achieve up to 6.5 millimeters of tissue depth. So the idea of use, uh, utilizing oviponics, be it between implants or between natural teeth, can provide us excellent soft tissue uh, to optimize aesthetic outcomes. Periodontal biotype has been um, discussed thoroughly today, but I don't want to leave it out in my discussion where we know very well that the, the thick and flat is going to be more predictable than the thin and highly scalloped. And that's what both Kois and Salama have, have taught us over the years in regards to um, some type of an expected outcome when it comes to periodontal biotype. Tooth form, the shape of the teeth, or our ability to modify the shape of the teeth, has a strong influence upon papillary form. The thrust of this talk today is about defect classification, how to classify them properly, and then how to implement treatment predictably with them. These are the four that I was able to find. Um, the classic by Siebert and then repeated by Dr. Allen uh, are very straightforward, buccolingual, uh, chronoapical, and combination defects. Dr. Sklar in his textbook talks about more of the composition of the defects, whether they're hard tissue, soft tissue, or com combined, and then how to address those based on an implant 
site preparation, not necessarily preservation of soft tissues for fixed partial dentures. Instituto does a nice job of severity and prognosis, which I have some tables for you to, to help uh, um, clear these things up. Basically, Seabird and Allen are the same, just a slightly different um, numerical versus alphabetical nomenclature to them, but it's the horizontal uh, defect being normal in the class one, uh, in the class two vertical uh, being normal, and then the combination where we're having both a, a horizontal and a vertical component. In classifying severity between less than th three millimeters being mild, moderate, three to six, and greater than six severe. What Studer did very nicely was give us some idea of prognosis, but it's, it, it is really quite straightforward that the defects classification, individual class one, two, three, the worse the defect, the worse the prognosis. Same with horizontal. The worse the horizontal defect, the worse the prognosis of our treatment. The expanse of the defect, whether it's single teeth all the way up to multiple teeth defect, it's going to make us it's going to make it more of a challenge to completely augment the pre-existing defect. And same goes with the vertical component. Um, the more we all know that one of the hardest things we do is, is grow tissue vertically. Just as a means of, of showing a few defects, the class one is the buccolingual loss of tissue with normal ridge height in the apical coronal direction. Two examples of relatively good papillary height between the defect but a significant buckle, buckle ridge loss. This would probably fit into the three millimeter soft tissue realm because of, uh, so it would fit into the moderate defect. This being a alveolar ridge defect with adequate bone but inadequate soft tissues and via implant combined with soft tissue augmentation we're able to improve the profile next to the dental implant supported restoration. The class two defect, apical coronal loss of tissue with normal ridge width in a buccal-lingual dimension. Here's a, uh, a case with a failed dental implant presenting with a patient that will abso not, absolutely not go back through dental implant therapy, so we need to determine the way to reconstruct a horizontal defect to create more even tooth lengths. The class three defect combination of buccal-lingual and apical coronal tissue loss that results in a loss of normal height and with combined horizontal and vertical bone loss. These are the types of cases that we really need to think long and hard about whether they could be treated at all, especially a patient like this that presents with a failed hard and soft tissue, two separate procedures, already been through a hard and soft tissue attempt. Hard tissue is particulate, soft tissue is with a cellular dermal matrix. Um, and she presents not just with her husband, but with an attorney. So is this the type of patient that we are going to want to jump into complicated therapy to reconstruct a defect? Perhaps maybe this patient is best served with porcelain of a pink and uh, white nature. Another defect, um, what we've got going for us here is the, mes the, the attachment on the natural teeth, uh, the defect was created by an impacted cuspid that um, was ankylosed and caused resorption on the lateral incisor. In a defect like this from a motor vehicle accident, uh, post-trauma, a block graft was attempted. Um, and this is another case that presents as to whether we can really truly meet the patient's expectations. And in this case, it wasn't the patient's expectations that we weren't able to really meet. It was the mother's. So this patient went on her way without any treatment at all, uh, and to my knowledge is still wearing a, a fairly aesthetic removable partial denture. And a defect like this poses its problems to treatment most, most definitely. Well, obviously, the most effective way of preventing soft and hard tissue loss is preventing it in the first place by at the time of extraction performing, performing ridge preservation. So before I actually get to ridge reconstruction or defect reconstruction, we'll just quickly review the importance of tissue preservation. There have been many articles talking about flap design to maintain soft tissues. 
and certainly we want to take these into considerations both with our traditional periodontal therapy as well as with dental extraction therapies and dental implant replacement therapies. Talking about preservation, uh, we'll certainly ask our referral colleagues to let us know if this is something that they would like us to do. Would, would they like us to extract the tooth and, pre tooth and preserve the ridge? Would they like us to re deliver the rest provisional restoration? Will it be fixed or removable? And using a referral slip such as this, it helps communication and it is have to have the proper discussion about not just expectations of treatment, but expectations of cost. Who's going to be paying or who's going to be compensated for which procedure? Ridge preservation is something that we all should feel extremely comfortable with. It's highly predictable. Uh, it's something that we can, even with a very relatively inexpensive removable partial denture, preserve hard and soft tissues. We know that the presence of that partial denture in the extraction site will help us by maintaining uh, gingival embrasure form responsible for the ultimate height of the papilla, especially when we're talking about natural teeth because we should be able to maintain a healthy attachment level on the natural teeth. We won't have anything influencing the resorption of bone interproximally if dental implants are not in the treatment plan. We must not only support papilla, we must support the facial gingival margin appropriately with a depth of at least two and a half millimeters. Through a fixed restoration with an ovaponic design or with a removable partial denture, these are critical at the time of extraction to be modified appropriately to support the soft tissues um, the best that we can. Going through not only the fact that placing something into this defect, our previous lecturer mentioned the Nevin study that if we are through cross-sectional analysis revealed significant bone preservation by grafting the extraction site. And I truly believe that if we are going to be removing a tooth in the aesthetic zone, something should go into that socket. I'll certainly not argue but that extraction site may heal on its own without any graft. But if we're talking about soft tissue preservation as a means of optimizing an aesthetic outcome, I would like to put something into that defect. In our office, usually it's something like freeze-dried bone covered with a quickly resorbing collagen membrane. And the most important piece of this puzzle is the removable partial denture that oftentimes come to our office like this and we simply modify with flowable composite to support the soft tissues appropriately. And with this we can end up with maintained facial and interproximal soft tissues, avoiding things such as this by not placing the graft. This is an example from Dr. Nevin's article. So within a few months we have favorable healing and we've got a site that really we're pretty happy with in regards to a bridge, resin bonded bridge or a dental implant. For demonstration purposes, we've merely drawn on our ponic showing the, the apical extent of that portion of the ponic supporting the facial ginger, gingiva, creating a nice sharp gingival margin profile that is aesthetically pleasing and has proper contours from profile as well as the direct buckle. More challenging defects may need more flap reflection, but they certainly should be preserved in a, uh, in a similar manner, if not with using extra uh, modalities as we did in this case. We used a allograft for our sockets, a membrane, and then some alloderm over the surface of that to reconstruct the buckle plate and end with a ridge that we're happy with two months later. And whether it's, again, whether it's going to be dental implants or uh, a fixed partial denture, we're preserving tissue to optimize the aesthetic outcome. Before we get to the defect design, ovate ponic uh, preparation is, is essential. Uh, we're able to accentuate the shape of the papilla, create the illusion of a free gingival margin, and it can be simply done with multiple tools. Historically, we may have used an electric surgical device to create an ovate ponic uh, and support that facial gingival margin and papillary tissues. Using our restorative uh, education and abilities by adding flowable composite to ponics, to get the appropriate depth within the soft tissues, delivering in the provisional restoration and leading to an optimal aesthetic outcome in the fixed partial denture. We can use our rotary instruments, certainly for ovate ponic site preparation. Today, 
We'll even consider going beyond a rotary or electro surge and use a dental laser for ovate ponic site preparation. This is an example of uh, my partners just showing the longevity of an ovate ponic. Many people will ask restorative colleagues, what is the health, the long-term health of an ovate ponic? This bridge was uh, done by a, a very uh, wonderful restorative dentist in Houston and was never placed with permanent cement for documentation purposes. Patient was seen frequently. And we can see as taking this off at five and a half years, mainly to treat this recession defect right here, we also got a very nice look at the ponic site. So if constructed properly and cleansed properly, uh, these can hold up very nicely over time. And you'll notice that my partner has done a nice root coverage graft to cover an exposed restorative margin there. Another case of just showing the longevity of an ovate ponic site, bringing you through the time points of one month post ridge augmentation, a second ridge augmentation, third ridge augmentation, and this is patient driven. There are certain episodes where, or certain instances where patients are driving us to optimal, don't want an implant, but we have treatment to allow for an optimal ovate ponic site, leading to a long lasting aesthetic restoration that holds up extremely well over time. So now I'd like to get into some case treatment in regards to treating the different classification of ridge defects with soft tissue. This fits into a, a, a larger discussion that we could spend all day on. Um, I think the main thing I'd like you to take away from this is that periodontal plastic surgery um, is pretty vast. There's a lot of things that we are able to do, and this is just one component of it, uh, treating the localized alveolar ridge deficiency. Treatment methods for alveolar ridge augmentation include the connective tissue graft or the soft tissue onlay graft, particularly bone grafting, block bone grafting, soft tissue substitutes, off-the-shelf type materials, guided tissue regeneration, distraction, or ridge expansion. For the purpose of my discussion, I will mainly focus on connective tissue. The class one defect we've already reviewed. This is an existing bridge that the patient really doesn't want replaced if we can't alter the tooth lengths. So simply by provisionalizing that, taking soft tissue from the tuberosity, and making our envelope flap to the buckle, we can alter the tooth length correct the alveolar ridge deficiency, and create the illusion of emergent uh, restoration emerging from the soft tissue. Very straightforward. Same thing here. A ridge lap to a reconstructed ridge that gives the appearance of a sharp free gingival margin in, in buccal profile, an aesthetic outcome that is more pleasing to the patient from how they presented. And these, again, the class one defects uh, are, are going to be hopefully a, a very straightforward uh, correction in our hands. A resin bonded bridge that's been there for close to 10 years, it's time to replace it. How can we improve the aesthetic outcome simply by a connective tissue ridge augmentation, nothing else? This patient presents with a failed implant. She is a uh, very astute um, healthcare provider herself and has just been burned by a very long, arduous process of dental implant replacement. Um, she had hard tissue preparation, which was successful, and then dental implant failure that took the hard, so the hard tissue augmentation away from her. And she didn't believe anything could be done for her. She was told that if this implant has failed, she's going to have to live with a situation like this. In profile, you'll see the significance of our ridge defect, but a class one defect. We still have good interproximal tissue heights. You give the gives you the idea of the buccal ridge deficiency that we have to deal with. Originally, it's dealt with with a connective tissue ridge augmentation, just like I showed with the class one defects. But in coronally advancing that mucosa, we still don't have an optimal aesthetic outcome. We've improved the profile, certainly, with one step, 
but now we need to come back and improve it just a touch more, both lengthwise as well as the discoloration of the mucosa. An onlay tissue graft is performed in this case, our second surgery. And now we've developed a site that is much more pleasing to the patient. And she's extremely happy and has regained her trust in dentistry. With a little bit of laser gingivectomy here, we can then move on to our final restoration, which has drastically improved her smile. And now, a few years out, it has maintain, maintained stability with a favorable aesthetic outcome. Certainly, in most of our eyes, we would probably try to talk to the patient about some other restorative treatment on adjacent teeth, uh, but this patient is, couldn't be happier with the outcome. This is a, uh, a case of my partners that, that, um, that we don't think of very often. Challenging case that, that uh, the bridge has been cemented in the, in the patient for one reason or another, a loss of communication, not understanding expectations, the bridge is cemented, and the, def 